Now that we've learned some of the fundamentals about websites that are built with HTML, CSS, and optionally Bootstrap, let's correlate that with how UiPath interacts with those websites using activities. The concept of selectors applies to more than just websites, but in this section, we'll focus on web selectors because there are some differences in web selectors compared to selectors we'll see on desktop applications. As we learned in the previous section, website pages are built with HTML, and more modern websites will also most likely incorporate CSS and Bootstrap as well, although they are optional. Older websites are less likely to use CSS and Bootstrap. We talked about HTML being comprised of tags that might also have attributes. UiPath is capable of interacting with elements using tags alone, but if the tags contain additional attributes, like ID or name or class, then our automation is often easier and more reliable. Web developers aren't always consistent in their use of attributes, which can lead to automation challenges. UiPath and other modern RPA tools are pretty smart, and UiPath in particular does its best to think for you when capturing selectors. But it's a good idea for you to understand tags and attributes so you can make some decisions for yourself and maybe even communicate to developers that adding some attributes to a website could result in more reliable automation. In this section, we'll look at some web automation basics so you can get a sense for how UiPath captures selectors for various tags that do and do not have attributes. Before we get into the details of this section, I want to provide a UiPath recorder disclaimer. The UiPath RPA tool does have a recorder which is intended to facilitate automation. It definitely can help and provide insight, but I just wanted to let you know that I rarely use it and show you why. After using the recorder, enough changes are required to the recorder's output that reduce the savings I get from using the recorder in the first place. Things like the activity description text, the variable names, and the fact that I have to go back and add shorter timeout values to all of the auto-generated activities kind of defeat the purpose of using the UiPath recorder. The only real benefit I get from it is if I don't know which activity to use, the recorder will choose that for me. Instead of using the recorder, I most often add activities manually because I can add them into existing sequences. I can then add the relevant activity description text instead of something that's auto-generated by the recorder. I can use my company's variable naming conventions instead of variable names that are auto-generated. I can inspect and modify the selector and that's something I'm going to show you in the next few lectures. And I can also add timeout values as I go. Let's take a quick look so you can visualize this. Here I've got a project open in the UiPath RPA tool. If you don't know anything about UiPath, this might be a little confusing, so I definitely recommend that you check out some of the first few lectures of the UiPath Level 1 course if you haven't seen this before. But at a very high level, this project has a sequence, which is simply a container for some steps that the automation is going to do. And you can see that gold band that acts as the container for these activities inside of it. This activity simply opens up a browser to this URL. And then there's another sequence in here called do. And then I get the text of the first paragraph and I log that message down here to the output window. This will actually close the tab, but you can see that I've got that commented out because I want to be able to run this robot over and over again without having to manually reopen that window. So if I needed to update this robot, I would have to add more activities here inside this do sequence. And like I said, my instinct would be to just go into activities, do a search and drag and drop in whatever activities I want to use because I'm familiar with those activities and I can quickly find them using the search feature. UiPath does have a sophisticated recorder. If I jump up here to the design menu and click on this recording icon and select web, it minimizes UiPath to the background and shows me this IE browser that I have open on this demo page one. If I click on this button, it allows me to record multiple activities at once. Each of these allow me to record individual events. So if I click on this record button, now you can see that I can hover over various elements and do something with them. So if I click on this text box, it prompts me to type in a value I'd like to enter here. So I'll just type in hello, and I have the ability to select this checkbox to empty the field before typing in that value. It says press enter when you're done, so I'll do that. You can see that it typed in that text, and of course if I wanted to do more recording, 
I could click on this text box or these links and continue recording. If I hit escape, that stops the recording of multiple activities, but I can still go and do something like text, copy text, and then select any one of these text elements to copy its text. So if I click on that, that process is done. I can click on close. It prompts me to save, so I select yes. And now I'm back at UiPath and my new recording sequence is highlighted. So right away, you can see that it did generate a brand new sequence with all this extra stuff. I've got this sequence, and then I've got this attach to browser activity, and then I've got another do sequence, and then I finally have the two activities that I'm trying to record. So ideally those two activities are going to go back up here inside my original do within my web process sequence. But by recording, I generated all this overhead, this recording sequence, the attached to browser, this extra do, none of those things do I need. Also notice that, like I mentioned in the slide, the description for this activity is auto-generated and not as useful as something I might have typed myself like this one, get text of the first paragraph. It's not too bad, but I'll still have to go and rename this to something like type into first text box. Of course, I'll have to rename this one as well. And as you'll learn from the UiPath level one course, whenever I click on these activities, there are properties over here on the right hand side that allow me to change the characteristics of these activities. So in the case of getting this text, the text is going to be stored into a variable down here. And this variable name was auto-generated, and it's definitely not as intuitive as something I would have typed myself. Furthermore, each of these activities has a timeout value. And all that means is if either this text box or this paragraph tag didn't load in the website for some reason, UiPath would report an error about that. When we leave this timeout blank for either of these activities, the default timeout value is 30 seconds. So the robot will wait 30 seconds before it displays an error. I don't like UiPath to wait that long. So almost always I will go in here, click in that text box and type in something like 3000 milliseconds, which is only three seconds. So then I have to click on this one as well, click in the timeout and also type in 3000 milliseconds. Now, ideally what I'd like to do is to control click on these things and then use control X to pull them out of here and put them up into my do sequence up here near the top. So maybe I would click right after this one here and use control V to paste them in. And when I do that, you can see I'm getting an error on this one. And when I click on it and go over here, you can see that it's telling me that there's a compiler error and that this variable is not declared. Well, the reason why it's not declared is because of something called variable scope that you'll learn in the UiPath level one course. This variable is actually still down here in this recording sequence. If I expand the variables tab, you can see it's right there and its scope is the recording sequence. So now what I would have to do is to click on that scope and select web process to move that variable up here into this web process sequence. And notice when I do that, the error goes away. Of course, I still need to click on this and jump into the variables section and rename that variable to something more interesting. To do that, I can click on it and type in something like text from first paragraph. And when I do that, you can see that the variable has actually changed up here as well. But my point is, you can see all the extra stuff that I had to do when I used that recorder. And that's fine if you don't know which activities to use. But as you'll learn in the UiPath level one course, instead of recording something like this, I would just jump over here into the activities pane, enter a keyword like type, and then I see my type into activity. I can click and drag that right into the surface here. And then to connect it to the website, I can use this indicate element inside browser link. And when I click on that, I can simply select this text box and then click down here, open some double quotes and type in the value that I want to type. So again, I still have to go up here and rename this description and also add the timeout as well. But what I don't have to do is deal with all this overhead of all these sequences and copying things out of here and pasting it up here and then changing any variables from this scope to that scope and so on. So I don't really think that the recorder saves that much time. And for the rest of this course and UiPath level one, I'm primarily going to be adding activities by going in here manually searching for what I want and then dragging it into the robot canvas.
Hopefully that makes sense. In the next several lectures of this section, I'm going to be interacting with these three HTML files. And you can see I've got them stored on my local disk at C development HTML selectors. You can put them wherever you want. I'm going to open Visual Studio. And so that I can make edits to these pages while we play around, I'm going to open them in Visual Studio. Since the most recent files open towards the left side, I'll start from the bottom and drag in page three, then page two, then page one. So now you can see I have page one, two, and three open in Visual Studio, ready to edit if I need to. So we can see what the pages look like. I'll right click on page one and select open with Internet Explorer. So you can see page one just has a title, some sample paragraphs of text, a few sample text boxes, and some links that allow us to navigate between the pages. If I go to page two, the elements are very similar, but the title is different. And page three, again, has very similar elements. And this has a link to get me back to page one. If we look at the HTML markup, it's pretty basic. You can see we've got an opening HTML tag. Then we've got our opening and closing head tag that has a title tag inside. This link tag is pulling in our bootstrap CSS, which makes the page look a little nicer. Then I've got my body, beginning and end, and I simply have a few divs that contain those paragraphs and text boxes and links. And of course, there's my H1 title. So this is pretty much everything you learned about in the last section. One thing that I wanted to point out is that page one here, as you can see, has attributes. So each of these P tags has an ID attribute on it that will make our automation easier. Same thing with these text boxes. They each have IDs as well, as do the links. Whereas if we go and look at page two, you'll notice those do not have ID attributes. So we'll see in another lecture what kind of problems that will cause. There's nothing real special about page three, but you can play around with that one if you want to. So in the next lecture, we'll take a look at the very basics of HTML selectors. In this lecture, we'll cover the very basics of UiPath selectors. There are other RPA tools, and I may add those in future lectures as well. But for now, UiPath makes it pretty easy to understand how selectors work. What we're going to do is create a new UiPath project. We'll open up a browser with our desired web page, and then we're going to drag activities onto the canvas and associate them with web elements on the page. Then what we'll do is click on the activity and inspect the target field of the activity because that's what contains the selector for the web element. What you're going to notice is that most web selectors look very similar to one another. They actually look like a tag from a website. They all have this name WebCTRL, which is short for web control. And much like I described in the previous section, there are two parts to the selector, the tag, which could be something like a P tag, or an A tag, or a div tag, and so on. And then one or more attributes as well. In this case, we see an ID attribute, which is certainly the most popular and reliable attribute to use. So let's go check it out. As I mentioned, I've got this page1.html page open in the IE browser. I've got UiPath open, and I'm going to create a new blank project called selectors in my C development UiPath directory. I'll copy that and paste it down here and click on create. As you'll learn in the UiPath level one course, I can double click on this menu to hide this ribbon and give myself more space to work. Any robot we create is going to have either a sequence or a flowchart as the very first activity. So I'll click on my activities tab and type in sequence and I'll click and drag my sequence onto the canvas. I'll click in here and rename this to anything you want, but I'll call mine Selector Basics Workflow Example. And the first thing we're going to do when we interact with a web browser is have the ability to open and close the web browser. So I'll go back into Activities, type in Browser. Notice I can either attach to a browser that's already open, but in this case, I'm going to use Open Browser. So I'll click and drag that in here. And notice that gives me this open browser activity with another sequence inside here for what I want to do after the browser is open. When I click on the open browser activity, I can select which browser I want to open, i.e. Firefox or Chrome. I'll leave mine to i.e. And I can specify the URL of the page that I want to open. In this case, that will be this local file URL right here. 
So I will select that, use Control C to copy it, open my double quotes there, and Control V to paste that URL in. And when I click away, that warning icon disappears. So I've already got a robot that will run. All it's going to do is open the browser. So if I minimize UiPath and close this browser, and then click on this Run button in UiPath, notice it opens the browser to that page. I'll talk about how to close that browser in a future lecture. But right now I want to stay focused on using our selectors. As I mentioned, inside this open browser activity is this do sequence right here. And we can click in here and rename this to whatever we want. I'll just rename mine do some stuff. And if I bring IE11 back up, what do we want to do? We want to read some of this text. We want to type something into these text boxes and maybe click on one of these links to go to a different page. So to demonstrate how to capture these locators, I will leave this web page open and go back to UiPath. And as I explained in the previous video, inside this design tab, there's a recorder and you can click on here and use the web recorder if you want to try to do things quickly. I don't tend to use that. What I do instead is click on activities. And like I mentioned, we want to do some stuff with text. So I type in text. And you can see that filters down our list and under available UI automation element control, you can see we've got this get text. If I click on that and drag it in here, now I've got this get text activity and I've got this blue link where I can indicate the element inside the browser. So when I click on that, it minimizes UI path and allows me to hover over these various elements and select the one that I want to use. So I'll click on this first paragraph and as I mentioned in the slide, we're going to inspect the target field of the activity and we're going to see a web control, hopefully with some kind of a tag and attribute. So when I do click on that activity over here in the property inspector, there's a target field. And when you expand that, that's where you'll find this selector field. If you click on these three dots, you can see the entire selector. So just like I said, it looks like a tag. It's a web control. The tag is a P tag, which means paragraph, and the ID it captured is first paragraph. If we jump back to Visual Studio on page 1.html, this is what we selected. And you can see that it is in fact a P tag with an ID of first paragraph. So UiPath automatically generated a selector for that P tag with an ID of first paragraph. So that looks fine. It's exactly what we would expect. I'll click on OK. I can rename this to get text of first paragraph. And I could do something very similar if I wanted to type into this text box. I would simply go into activities, enter type. I see type into, I'll click and drag that out here. I'll make sure my browser is available in the background. I've got that same kind of link here. I'll click on that and I'll hover over whichever text box I'd like to type into. We'll use this first one here and again, the activity was generated, and over here in the selector, when I click these three dots, you can see again, I have a web control, and this time the tag is input, and the ID is text box one. We cross-check that in Visual Studio. Sure enough, our tag was an input, and the ID is text box one. Click OK for that one, and here we have to decide what do we want to type into this. I'll just open some quotes and type in, hello there. I'll click up here and rename this as type into first text box. And now we want to click a link. So let's go back to activities. I'll type in click and you can see under available UI automation element mouse click. I will drag that click right in here. Again, I'll make sure my browser is available in the background. I will click on this blue link and I'll hover over whatever link I want to click on and click on it. You can see it captured a screenshot of that link and highlighted the one that I clicked on. I can rename this to click page to link. And if we go and take a look at the selector again, we've got a web control with a tag of a, which means anchor. And the ID is page to link back in visual studio. You can see that my tag here is in fact an a tag and my ID is page to link. Click on. Okay. 
So you can see it's that simple to open a browser and interact with elements by dragging and dropping activities onto the canvas. I'll go ahead and close this browser and bring UiPath back up and run the robot. And we should see that browser open. We see the text typed in and it clicked on the page two link, which navigated us to page two.html. So there you go. That's the basics of using selectors in UiPath. In the previous lecture, we interacted with page one.html, which was a best case scenario because all of the elements on the page had ID attributes. It left us on page two and none of these elements have any kind of attributes on them. We can verify by looking at page two within Visual Studio. On this page, all we have are HTML tags with no other attributes at all. So let's see what kind of trouble that gets us when we try to use UiPath to automate the page. Before we add the page two activities, I just want to finish up this step on page one where we got text from the first paragraph. Anytime you use get text over here in the properties pane, you have an output section where you can click in here and right click and create a new variable to capture the text that was found in that control. I'll talk about variables in the next section, but for now, I'm just gonna name this variable page one, para one, and hit return. And after I get the text, I'm gonna click up here and type log message and click and drag log message right after I get that text. And I'm going to log page one, para one, hit tab and then type dot to string hit tab again, and what this activity is going to do is take the text value we got from this activity and write it into a log down here in the output pane so we can see it. So I'm gonna close this browser, run the robot once more, and we wind up on page two again, and down here in the output section, you can see it says, this is text one, which came from page one right here. So I'm gonna click here to go back to page two and we'll pick up from where we left off here in UiPath. I'm going to try basically the same thing on page two as I did on page one. We'll try to get text of the first paragraph. We will log that. Then we'll type into the first text box again and then click on the link to page three. While it might seem convenient to just jump down here to the bottom and start working, I'd like you to start thinking early about the notion of organizing things in a way that makes your scripts more readable. And what I mean by that is that our website currently has three pages. And you can see here, we're going to open the browser, then we're gonna do some stuff. And that's a sequence. And yes, we could string together a whole bunch of activities in here with no regard for which page we're on. But my preference would be to start up here at the beginning of do some stuff, add in another sequence, and name this something like page one steps. And then I'll use my control key and my mouse wheel to zoom out a little bit so I can see all these activities. And I will control click to select what we've done so far and then click on this first one and drag it into page one steps. So now inside my do some stuff container sequence, I've got a page one steps container. And you can see over here on the right, eventually I'll have another sequence over here called page two steps and maybe page three steps and so on. Of course, in a real business process, these names would be something more significant. But for now, hopefully you get the idea that we should be thinking about structure and organization anytime we're creating a script. So what this extra structure is going to allow me to do is actually click on this page one steps activity, use control C, and then click down here below the golden outline and use control V to paste in a whole nother copy of that set of activities. So now I have page one steps and another page one steps that of course I can rename as page two steps. So that's gonna save me some time for my page two work so I won't have to drag those activities onto the page again. I can simply reuse what we've got going here. Of course, since these new page two activities have already been set up to talk to page one, I no longer have that blue link that allows me to connect it to these page two elements. What I can do in that case is use this little hamburger icon and click here, and I can now use this one, indicate on screen. First, I'll make sure my browser is visible in the background. Then I'll click on that, indicate on screen, and I'll click on this paragraph like we did before. And now you can just see that in this new snapshot that it took, 
it actually says demo page 2 right there, whereas up here we can see it was demo page 1. So now this one is connected to the first element on page 1, and it has a target that reflects that appropriately, containing the tag and the ID, whereas this one down here reflects the first paragraph on page 2. And if we go into this target selector field and click on these three dots, you can see that the selector now looks different. It's still using a tag, but notice there's no attribute. Now it's using idx equals 1, which means index equals 1. And that simply means the first tag of type paragraph that it finds on the page. If we go back into Visual Studio on page 2, you can see that this is in fact the very first P on the page. Nowhere above this does P exist. UiPath didn't complain at all when it was gathering this up, so let's roll with it for now. You can see over here in this output section, it's still using page 1 para 1, which is the variable that I had created up here. I'm going to click in page 1 steps and then select this variables tab down here to see where my variable lives. You can see that the scope of that variable is do some stuff, which means that this variable is visible throughout any activity that exists inside this do some stuff container. And this is a topic called variable scope, and I cover it in more depth in the UiPath level one course. So the bottom line is I want to scroll down here to my page two steps and use a different variable to capture the information from demo page two's first paragraph. So I'll jump down here and highlight and delete this and right click again to create a new variable called page two para one. Hit return and I'll select that variable text to copy it and then jump down here and then go into this log message activity. And instead of logging page one para one, I'm gonna select over that and instead log page two para one, which is what we captured here. Now, so that we don't get confused, I'm gonna go into Visual Studio and change this page two text to add page two to each of these paragraphs. And on page one, I'll add in page one so that we don't get confused by the text we capture in UiPath. I'll control S to save page one and control S to save page two. So now when I go into this page here and hit refresh, you'll see that we now have better information here. Back here in UiPath, we want to type information into a text box. And again, this one is still pointing at the text box for page one. So let's make sure our web page is visible in the background on page two. And then we'll click on this hamburger icon and indicate on screen. So that's this text box right here. I will click on that. And let's again, examine the selector it shows. It's still a web control. The tag type is input. And again, index number one. So we'll accept that, click okay. And now we're going to click on the page three link. I'll change that text right there. And we'll use that hamburger icon to indicate on screen and select this link right here. Again, we'll examine the target for this one. You can see that it is a web control tag of type A, which means anchor. And it's using this text name here called go to page three. That's how it's identifying it. Let's compare that with what we did for page one. Up here on page one, you can see that when we clicked on this link, it used a tag of A and our ID attribute. And what that means is no matter what text the link has, for instance, they might change this numerical one to the word O-N-E, this link is still going to work because we're using an ID under the covers. Whereas down here, this one we just created now, you can see that if they change the text of that link to something like page three, this is no longer going to work because we're expecting it to say, go to page three. So already, hopefully you can see that when there's not an attribute present behind the scenes, UiPath does some thinking for you and says, hey, let me use whatever I can to select this link even though it might not be as reliable as using an attribute. And so this is where you might be able to speak up as an RPA developer. If you have any reason to believe that this link text is going to change, you could request that they add an HTML ID to this link. And that's as simple as just typing in 
ID equals, and then open some quotes and putting in whatever you want for the ID, as long as it's unique on the page. Of course, if this text is not expected to change, that might not necessarily be a problem. So take this on a case by case basis. I'll hit OK, close up the website, and run the robot. So we're on page one, we type in our text, click on page two, type in some more text, and we're done. Let's go back and look in the output section here. You see that we got this is text one from page one, and this is text one from page two. So far, so good. So let's take a look at what kind of risks can occur from using selectors like we've just achieved. Sometimes websites change. The business people might decide that certain text needs to go above or below other text, and business needs cause the website to change. Ideally, RPA is going to be implemented on websites that don't change very often, but in certain companies, your RPA may be interacting with websites that do change, so let's take a look at that. Let's say, for instance, that the business decided, hmm, this paragraph of text makes far more sense to be right here at the top. So now you can see that we have text two appearing above text one. I'll use control S to save and right click to open that file with Internet Explorer. So now you see instead of text one being at the top, text two is at the top. If it was really important for our robot to capture this text information, let's see if the robot was impacted by this change. So I'll close the browser and rerun the robot. Page one, we type in the text, click on page two, type in the text and we're done. Go down to output and notice now we've captured this is text one from page one, but we got this is text two from page two, which is not what we want. Just for kicks, let's go to page one here and do the same thing on these paragraphs that have IDs. So if I grab that second paragraph and move it above, now you can see we have text two above text one. I'll use control S here. And in the browser, I'll go back to page one. And you can see page one now also has text two above text one. I'll close up the browser, rerun the robot. Page one, we type text. Page two, we type text, we're done. Go down here to output. And notice we still have this is text one from page one, and this is text two from page two. So page one was not impacted by the change because of the fact that we're locating that element using this ID instead of an index. In this set of page two steps here, you might recall that our locator is using index number one. And of course, now that we've changed the page, index number one is the wrong text. So again, if your website doesn't change very often, none of this is really a big deal. But I wanted to show you how important it can be that the websites you're automating have some attributes that you can work with. There's even more to this selector complexity, but for now, hopefully this gives you a good sense of the fact that you do need to increase your technical skills to be able to detect and mitigate problems like this you might find on the websites you're automating. Dynamic selectors are a very important skill to know. Some website development tools generate HTML IDs automatically. So instead of an ID like first name, you'd see something like first name and then this long number either at the end or at the beginning. Anytime you see a long series of numbers like that, there's a good chance that you're looking at a dynamic ID. With dynamic IDs, if you capture the ID to use for your automation, you'll find that the next time you log in, you might see that the ID has changed to something like first name with this other number. So of course your automation is going to fail because the ID is now different than it was when you captured it. The bottom line here is if the ID keeps changing, your script simply won't be able to find that element. An important thing to notice is that part of the ID doesn't change. We call that the static part. The part that is changing is what's referred to as dynamic. UiPath has a feature that allows us to use what's called a wildcard character, which is an asterisk or a question mark in place of that dynamic part of the ID. You'd use an asterisk to represent one or more characters, whereas the question mark can be used to represent only one character. So that would look something like first name dash asterisk if you were trying to represent multiple characters that are changing, or maybe something like first name dash question mark if there was only a one or a two or a three at the end. 
let's jump into UiPath and take a look at how this works. I've still got my same three HTML files open in Visual Studio. And you may recall that our automation is capturing this paragraph in the page one activities. And we're capturing it by using this ID right here. If I was to add a hyphen at the end and a random series of numbers like that, that represents what a dynamic ID might look like. I'll hit Control S to save that to make sure that our changes are saved and then bring up UiPath and run the robot. And notice UiPath is now stuck here on the page one activities. And eventually it pops up this error dialog that says main has thrown an exception. And you can see the source is get text of first paragraph, which is right where we expected it to be. It's telling us it cannot find the UI element corresponding to this selector. And of course it can't find it because it's looking for this ID without those numbers on the end. And the exception type is selector not found exception. So we'll click on okay. And we'll jump into the selector for this activity. And you may recall that I added on a hyphen with all these numbers. So what we would need to do is drop that hyphen in here and add our wildcard character, which is the asterisk. And that asterisk symbol is going to represent any number of characters that might occur after that dash. If we were only expecting one character to be there, we could simply use this question mark. So I'll add this asterisk back in and click OK. Close up the website and hit play. So now as you can see, the robot continues and ends successfully. So again, this wildcard character, the asterisk symbol, is representing all these numbers. So I could change these to some different series of numbers, no matter how long, and use Control S to save. And if I run the robot again, it still works just fine. So definitely experiment with these dynamic selectors because they'll definitely come in handy.